All right. So now we will have another conversation. Uh, if you enjoyed the conversation we had this morning with Emmanuel Macron, as much as I did, then I hope you'll enjoy the conversation we're now going to have with our next guest for a conversation just as much. It's my pleasure to invite, to join me here on the stage, Mark Zuckerberg, the Chief Executive of Facebook. Mark, please join me here. Thanks. So we don't, we don't have a, a whole lot of time, I'm afraid to say. So I'll try to be, I'll try to limit myself to just a couple of opening questions. And then if we have enough time, maybe uh, we'll can, we can take a couple of questions from, from you, from the audience. So Mark, I mean, we're talking about international security here, foreign policy, defense security. One of the new issues, um, you know, in addition to rockets and, and, and tanks and military issues, one of the new questions for us is uh, how concerned do we need to be about meddling in our elections, about manipulation um, of democratic processes um, that, that would and have, in fact, in various countries, uh, led to a fall in confidence mm -hmm. for the voters, for the, for the larger public, and what, if anything, um, is your view as the, as, I mean, you know, if Facebook were a country, Mark would be the president of the largest country in the world because you have more users than the biggest countries in the world. So what, if anything, can Facebook contribute to encouraging people to, to have trust in the system and, um, and, and that everything is being done to prevent the manipulation mm -hmm. of our democratic processes. Diego. Sure, so uh, thank you, it's great to be here. Um, on elections, uh, certainly there are a number of threats here. Uh, what we've seen since 2016, uh, after Brexit and uh, the US elections in 2016 where uh, we and I think, frankly, probably all of the internet companies were, were slow to understanding the kind of information operations uh, that, uh, that Russia and others were, were running online. Um, since then, we've seen the tactics evolve. Uh, there have been more than 200 elections around the world since then uh, that we've played a role in helping to defend the integrity of. After those in 2016, we really um, looked at this and said, okay, it's, we're, the security landscape that we face is not just one of traditional hacking. Um, like we'd seen before, it's now one where these kind of coordinated information campaigns are gonna be an increasing part of the landscape. So we need to make sure that we get ahead of that. And we've developed a number of techniques for doing that that I think have been quite successful. Uh, mostly developing AI systems that can identify uh, fake accounts and networks of accounts that aren't behaving in the ways that people would. Um, in the last year or so, we took down about 50 uh, coordinated information uh, operations, including in, in the last couple of weeks, we took down one uh, that was coming out of Russia in, in Ukraine, um, and one coming out of Iran that was targeting uh, the US. Uh, and we've gotten increasingly sophisticated at working on this. Um, we take down now more than a million fake accounts a day across our network. Um, the vast majority of those are within minutes of signing up for the fake account. The, the vast majority are not connected to state actors trying to interfere in elections. They're you know, a combination of spammers and people trying to do different things, but certainly part of that is, is a state effort. Um, so the AI systems to identify when, um, when accounts are not behaving in the way that people would are really important. Um, the collaborations with governments and election commissions are significantly stronger than they were in 2016 around the world um, with the intelligence community. Uh, there's good or, or at least significantly better exchange between the tech companies of signals that we see and threats that we see um, with the intelligence community and law enforcement around the world, that is going quite well. Um, in the last year, we've seen uh, evolution of, of the threats um, in, in a few big ways. Um, 
one of the things that we're tracking that, that we have been quite worried about is that increasingly election interference through these coordinated information campaigns is not just foreign interference of the type that we saw before, but it's increasingly also domestic. Um, so you have political parties in different countries and local actors um, also trying to employ the same kind of tactics. Um, some of the same systems around um, AI um, and, and just human operations that we have inside our companies are still able to identify that and identify fake accounts and inauthentic behavior and take that down. Um, but it is somewhat harder because we're not now just able to say, hey, something coming from a foreign country can't participate um, in this electoral discourse when, when the interference is coming from inside the house or inside uh, the country. We've also definitely seen uh, these actors get more sophisticated at trying to hide their tracks. So it used to be, you know, there would be a network of, of different actors um, who were all kind of coming from the same IP address in one country. And now they're trying to mask their behavior by, you know, at least coming from different networks. Um, you know, often trying to appear as if they're coming from a number of different countries, but the same kind of systems that we have uh, that, that are detecting this kind of behavior are, are generally improving in sophistication at a faster rate than the adversaries are. So that's good, but we need to watch out for this. This, uh, just a, one final thought on this, is this is just a massive effort for us at this point. Um, in addition to the technology that I mentioned, we have 35,000 people now at Facebook um, working on content and security review. Um, so to put that in perspective, our budget in 2020 on security for these and other kinds of threats is bigger today than the whole revenue of our company was when we went public in 2012. Um, and it's not like we were a small company then. There were a billion people using our services in 2012. But the scale of what we need to do on security today is bigger than the scale of what the whole company was uh, just eight years ago. So certainly the, the threats are out there. Um, I think we, we are getting increasingly sophisticated. The partnerships are getting better. I'm more confident um, about where we are. You know, in the EU parliamentary elections that, that uh, you know, recently happened, um, you know, I actually went and testified in the EU parliament about a number of things that we were doing. And afterwards, the president of the parliament issued a statement saying that, that he felt like we'd honored our commitments and, and helped to uh, deliver a relatively clean election online. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the results that we've made here, but we need to stay vigilant. This is definitely an area where there will continue to be um, threats. It's, it's interesting for, for this crowd, the you know, security specialists in this room, that apparently what's going on in your field is exactly the same thing that's been going on in the classic military field. As your offense improves, the defense sharpens up and starts becoming more sophisticated. Um, and, and, and that mutually reinforce, reinforces each other. So is that a process that you see? I mean, you mentioned it already. They, they are beginning to get more sophisticated. Are you sure that you can you know, stay ahead of, the, of this? And, 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 and catch the bad guys? Well, as you say, it is adversarial. So we improve, uh, the law enforcement community improves, the partnerships improve, the adversaries are also improving. Um, I think given how little the baseline level of defense against this kind of attack was in 2016, we've been able to improve the defenses at a substantially faster rate than uh, the adversaries have been able to improve the offense. But, but it is evolving, um, and, and like you say, they are improving. So there are different kinds of threats that we see. So moving on from elections for a second, um, that's certainly one kind of content issue, but we also have issues around things like hate speech. And one of the differences between hate speech and elections is that the people who go out, who, who say hateful things, aren't necessarily getting smarter at saying hateful things. So as the AI systems get better, we generally are just catching more and more of the hate speech, um, and they were able to take it down. And it's, it's not like, um, like that, like hate speech is getting more sophisticated. So there, it's, I, I think that as the systems get better, we will get closer and closer to having a lower prevalence of that on the systems. Whereas in something that is adversarial, like elections um, or, or election interference, it, we just need to stay on top of it. And I, I think we can't take for granted, this isn't a problem that you ever fully solve. Um, we, it, it, we'll, we'll keep on needing to, to work on the, the defenses. Um, but at this point, I do feel like we're improving faster uh, than, than the adversaries. And there have been a track record um, since 2016 
of a number of very important high profile major elections, which I think there have been relatively clean results um, in an online discourse in that I think can give us some confidence going forward. So what you're saying is, if I can rephrase this, I mean, I, I read that um, in the summer of 2018, you were quoted saying that you would need about one and a half years to fully, quote unquote, retool Facebook's content and security rules. Now, are you saying that you're not confident that you're equipped to handle these growing threats of disinformation and data abuse? So on election interference specifically, I'm quite proud of and confident in the progress that we've made because we've been able to test it in different elections along the way. Um, there will always be new threats as well. I mean, this kind of information operations and foreign interference was a relatively newer threat on the internet. Before that, we saw a lot of traditional hacking. Um, we still see a lot of that as well. Um, you know, increasingly, uh, we see hackers try to target campaigns to basically find salacious information and dump it. So we've developed this program that we call Facebook Protect, um, which is a free service that we offer to anyone running a a campaign around the world so that they can basically give us a, lift, a list of all their staff in the campaign um, and we'll go through the staff and make sure that they all have the highest security enabled on all their accounts, two-factor authentication, that we have more aggressive monitoring on, the, on those accounts. And that way we'll, we'll know also, I mean, if one account gets compromised, okay, maybe that was a fluke or a random hacker doing that, but if, if we see two, three accounts from the same campaign get get compromised, now we know who the, all the people are in that campaign, then we know that there's a coordinated effort and we know that that should be a higher priority for law enforcement and for that campaign to work on. But there are those kind of threats as well. So th that's th th this type of stuff, it's, there, there will be new types of threats in the future, we need to stay ahead of those. Um, in general, we've gone through a big transformation over the last several years um, where we've gone from being uh, more reactive about addressing um, content type issues to more proactive. So just to kind of elucidate on what I mean by that. And when, when I got started, you know, I, I started the company in my dorm room. Um, and you know, back then obviously we could not have 35,000 people doing content and security review. Um, the AI 16 years ago did not exist at the same level that it does today to, um, to identify this type of harmful stuff. So basically the way that the company ran for the first 12 years um, was that People in the community, if they saw something that they thought was harmful, they would flag it for us, and we would look at it reactively. And I, for a while, I, that was reasonable, um, but then you know, we got to a point where you know, we were a large enough scale company that we should be able to have a multi-billion dollar effort on content and security review. The AI technology evolved to the point where now we can proactively identify a lot of different types of content, so we have a responsibility to do that. But going from reactive to proactive on this was a multi-year journey. There are, you know, elections is one type of the, is is one type of the area that we're worried about, but there are about 20 different areas of of dangerous and harmful content that we track. Everything from terrorist propaganda to child exploitation to incitement of violence to hate speech to just go down the list. There are about 20 different types of categories, and the way that we judge ourselves is every six months we issue a transparency report of how much of this type of content are we finding on the service and what percent of the content on the service are our AI and other systems identifying and taking down before it's reported to us uh, by someone else. So in an area where we're doing quite well, terrorist propaganda, for example, you know, 99% of the terrorist propaganda from you know, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, and folks that we take down, our AI systems identify and remove before anyone on our network sees it. So that's good, right? That's, that's, that's a good result and we need to make sure that we get there on, on all of the different categories of content. Um, some are harder than others. So for example, hate speech is, is a particularly challenging one because we have to be able to train AI systems to detect really small nuances, right? Is someone posting a video of a racist attack because they're condemning it, which probably means they should be able to say that, or are they um, subtly encouraging other people to copy that attack? Um, and that, you know, multiply that challenge of kind of that subtlety linguistically by, you know, 150 languages around the world where we operate and the, the ability to make mistakes where we're taking down the wrong kind of thing. Um, but we're making progress. 24 months ago on hate speech, we were at 0% we were taking down proactively, and I think today we're at around 80%.
So it's, um, so it's, it's accelerating. Um, it is, it's, it's a hard problem. I don't know if we'll get that one to 99% anytime soon, but as AI continues improving, I think we're, we're gonna, that, that's a tailwind, and as we keep on investing in the technology, we'll be able to keep on doing better and better on this. But it's a, it's a long-term investment. Let me um, uh, raise an issue that concerns many people and experts uh, as a problem for society at large, the concern that the algorithms that are being used will create for the, you know, the democratic citizen not an accurate reflection of all of reality, but sort of a virtual reality talking of echo chambers and filter bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Tell us how you think about this and, and uh, to what extent you believe that that is hurtful to the kinds of societies that we want where people can have the full picture of information and not, are not gonna be confined more and more to some rather yeah. narrow flow of information. Yeah, so clearly in a lot of countries, polarization is increasing and that can be bad. The mission of the company is to give people the power to build communities and bring the world closer together. So I mean, our whole thing is about bringing communities together, bringing societies together, and bringing the world together. So I, I obviously do not want our services to be contributing to polarization. To the contrary, I, I want us to be a force for bringing people closer together. Um, the way that we do this is by helping people stay connected with the people they care about and build n kinds of communities. Most communities people are not worried about. If you're joining a, a church community or a community around sports, most people aren't thinking, okay, that's gonna be polarizing. It's these more extreme ideological communities that I think is what people worry about. And um, there, you know, we, we, I do think we have a responsibility to make sure if, if there are groups that are spreading a lot of misinformation or, um, or, or, or have other kind of um, violations or just kind of polarizing that we're not recommending that people join those groups. So if you wanna be a part of those groups, um, in general, as long as it's not violating our rules, then that's cool, you should be able to do that. You should be able to seek out the communities that we want, that you want, um, but we're not gonna be a force for recommending and, and trying to push you towards that. Um, overall, I do think that the narrative and how some people talk about this is out of step with some of the research that has been done. Um, so for example, there have been, um, these researchers at Stanford University studying polarization that have come up with um, some results that, that, that kind of go against what, what, what you're saying. One result is that it turns out that they, they studied the US specifically after 2016, and they found that the, the parts of the population that were the most polarized were actually the ones that were the least likely to be using the internet at all. So that at least, um, that was not causation, that's correlation, but it, it definitely at least suggests that um, that you want to look outside of just the internet is the primary um, factor that's causing this. More recently, they, they did a follow-up study. There was a long-term study across multiple, many countries around the world, including a number in Europe and the US, Canada, Australia, a lot of different places, tracking polarization over time. And what they found is that polarization is not trending consistently in every place. So in places like the US, it is growing quickly. Um, in a number of other countries, it's growing. In many places, it is flat or consistent over the last 20 years, and in some places, it's even down. But the internet and social media are pretty much everywhere. So if that were the dominant force that were causing polarization, then you would not expect to see different trajectories of polarization in all these different places, which, again, does not mean that polarization, um, that, that, that we don't have work to do to make sure that we're, we're a very positive force on this, but it at least um, should at, cause some people to question um, the, what, what I think has become a very popular narrative, that this is primarily because of the internet and, and social media. It's, um, from a lot of the research that's being done, it's not cl clear that that's true, but we also have work, we, we don't wanna make it so we're just not a negative, not, not negative, we wanna be a positive force on this as well. All right, um, I'll open for a, a couple of questions in just one second. I have one other question to ask you. I understand that after this weekend with these nice people here in Munich, you're going to go to Brussels. Um, actually, you could have the discussion with the uh, EU Commission right here because half of the EU Commission is actually in the room or maybe somewhere in one of the bilateral rooms. But my question is this.
the, 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 the subject, obviously, when you are in Brussels, is going to be regulation. If so, which, what kind of? And, and I'd like to hear from you, what kind of regulation do you think is good for our societies, but also acceptable to the company? What kind of regulation would you suggest should be embraced by the EU? What should be rejected? Give us your sense. So I think that there needs to be regulation in at least four areas touching our company. Um, and they are elections and, and political discourse around content more broadly, content moderation, um, privacy and data portability. And the, the, the reason why I really believe that this needs to happen is because there are a lot of decisions in these areas that are really just balances between different social values. Right? What, is, what should be the, the balance between free expression and safety? Right? What, is, what is political discourse and what's the boundary between that and political interference? Um, what, to what extent do we want companies to be locking down data and to what extent do we want them to be encouraging them to make it more open, to encourage more innovation and competition and academic research? So I believe what our responsibility is is to build the operational muscle to be able to proactively um, enforce whatever the policies and, and, and regulations are to make sure that we can fight election interference, take down content that's gonna be dangerous, um, have good auditing and controls on the data that we hold for, for people and businesses to make sure that, that, is, that people can have confidence in that. Um, but at some level, I, I do think that we don't want private companies making so many decisions about how to balance social equities without a more democratic process. So uh, I think that where, where the lines, in my opinion, should be drawn is there should be more um, guidance and regulation from the states on, um, on, on basically on, on what kind of, you know, take political advertising as an example, um, you know, what discourse should be allowed, um, or on the balance of, um, of free expression and, and some things that people call harmful expression, where do you draw the line? What kinds of systems should companies have to, have to develop? Um, in the absence of that kind of regulation, we will continue doing our best. Um, we're gonna build up the muscle to do it, um, to, to basically find stuff as proactively as possible. We will try to draw the lines in the right places. But I actually think on a lot of these questions that are trying to balance different social equities, it's not just about coming up with the right answer, it's about coming up with an answer that society feels is legitimate and that they can get behind and understand that, um, that he, you drew the line here on the balance between free expression and safety and um, not just, okay, is that the right answer? It's not that there's one right answer. People need to feel like, okay, enough people weighed in and, and that's why the answer should be this and we can get behind that. And I just don't think a private company will ever have the weight to create that kind of legitimacy. So that's why I'm arguing for this. I think fundamentally, it's, um, it's very important to build the kind of trust that will be necessary in the internet and in our industry. And you know, even if I'm not gonna agree with every regulation in the near term, um, I, I do think it's gonna be the thing that helps create trust and better governance of the internet and will benefit everyone, including us, over the long term. Uh, where were these hands up? Uh, mm -hmm. I think the one that I saw first was uh, Ronan Bergman. I'll, I'll, uh, can, can Ronan have a Microphone, please. I w if I had more time with you, I would have loved to also include a question about Libra, your currency uh, project. But here goes, here goes with Ronan. Hi. Uh, Ronan Bergman from uh, the New York Times. Uh, thank you, Mr. Struber, for these uh, elaborating uh, things that you just said. Uh, two quick questions. The first, and I know you and your team have already addressed that, but I didn't understand the previous explanation, so maybe you can elaborate. If uh, a journalist publishes a story in a paper. It's not just the journalist can, that can be sued for libel, but the paper as well. If someone posts something on Facebook, I think that your stand is that Facebook should not be liable, should not, or could not be prosecuted. Uh, in fact, there were a few times when I highlighted to uh, your team of things that were published that were not true, and they said it was not for us to judge if something is true or not. Second question. Um, Facebook and WhatsApp sued Israeli hacking company by the name of NSO, claiming that it used vulnerabilities in order to hack into phones. NSO not, uh, confirmed that it was them, but they said governments use our system 
our hacking software in order to catch the real bad guys. So maybe this lawsuit will uh, damage their ability, government's ability to work against terrorists, uh, proliferators, and, 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 and other organized crime. Thank you. Sure, so in terms of the regulatory framework on, on content, um, I do think that there should be regulation on harmful content. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that there's a question about which framework you, you use for this. And you know, right now there are two frameworks that I think people have for existing industries. There's like newspapers and existing media, which is the analogy that you drew. And then there's the uh, kind of telco type model, which is, okay, the data just flows through you, but you know, you're not gonna hold a telco responsible if someone says something harmful on, on a phone line. Um, but I, I actually think where we should be is somewhere in between. I, I think the newspaper analogy is clearly wrong because there are more than 100 billion pieces of content that people share on our services every day. So the idea that we should have some kind of human editor um, that goes and checks each one to make sure that it is okay um, is just not analogous to what happens in a newspaper or other media company. Now, as AI gets better, we'll be able to more efficiently filter out more of the bad stuff. Um, and, and, and I think we have a responsibility to do that better and with increasing precision. And uh, I think that companies should have to publish transparency reports like we do on the volume of content that they find or is reported to them, um, have to publish what percent they're able to identify proactively, and should have to show good faith and, and ability to improve on finding more uh, over time. But you know, to say that we should not have any harmful content on the service, you wouldn't be able to do that and give everyone a voice around the world, which I think would just be losing a huge value. So I think that a third regulatory system needs to be made, which is not the no anything liability for, for telcos, but is also not the um, saying that, assuming that there should be, that there's some number of people who can like oversee this um, in, in our headquarters, because um, like an editor at a newspaper, I just think that's not reasonable. To the NSO question, um, I mean, look, they'll, they'll, they can defend themselves in court um, if, if what they think that they're doing is legal, but you know, our view is that people should not be trying to hack into software that, um, that billions of people around the world use to try to communicate securely, so um, you know, they, they should try to defend themselves if what they think is, is right. Great, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. I can take one more question, and I think the one who's been waiting for the longest is Espen Bardeide of Norway over there. Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, I think this, in a sense, misses the point because the argument about polarization is that uh, the algorithms uh, confirms, you, you keep confirming what you already think, that you are brought into a universe in which your views are reconfirmed all the time. So it's not really about the individual piece of news or individual content piece, it's the fact that you get more of the same, whereas traditional media at least the good ones, try to contrast different opinions, which is very important for dialogue. So my sense is that my Facebook is fundamentally different from somebody else's Facebook because we have been clicking differently and we see the same issue from comple completely different views. Is that wrong? Well, maybe I can give you some data which will persuade you <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so the, the average person who uses Facebook um, is connected to a couple hundred people or more. And the content that shows up in your newsfeed is primarily, it's not determined by us, right? It's, it's, it's things that other people share, right? So you choose who your friends are and what pages and businesses you wanna follow, and then that's the content that's eligible to show up there. The algorithm matters because it helps rank things, but you know, most of the conversation is about news. Really what we're focused on doing is, you know, if your cousin has a baby, then you know, we better show that at the top or else you're gonna be pretty upset when you miss that. Um, out of the thousands of posts that you might have been able to see that day. Um, so that's the kind of ranking that we do, but it's fundamentally, it's more about sorting what, is, what, is, what, what people have shared than it is about choosing what you see. Um, now, before Facebook and before the internet, um, you know, the average person would maybe watch a couple of TV stations to get news, maybe read a couple of newspapers, and you're right that media tries to show some balance of views, but it's also undoubted that each media uh, outlet has kind of their own editorial view and, and slant that they bring to things. What we see within Facebook, and we've done a lot of social science research on this as well, is that even if you know, of your 200 plus friends, 
the majority of the people you know share some view or come from a similar place or have a same background, um, you're likely going to be connected to at least some people, you know, 10 to 15% of people um, who have pretty different views. So the data that we've seen is actually that people get exposed to more diverse views through social media than they were before through traditional media through a smaller number of channels. Now, there is the, um, the confirmation bias issue that you say, and one of the issues that we see is that, yeah, in your social media feed, you'll often see um, maybe a greater diversity of different types of content, um, but we also see that people are less likely to click on things that and engage with them if they, if they don't agree with them. So I don't know how to solve that problem. That's not a technology problem um, as, as much as it is a, a human affirmation problem in the way that you're saying. But I, I do think that as more data and research accumulates, um, the idea that social media and the internet are singularly the cause and are driving polarization, I think is being questioned quite a bit. Um, and it, again, it's not that we have no part of this so that we don't have to make sure that our systems do a better job. Our goal is to bring people closer together. So we don't just want to be not negative or not the most negative thing, right? We want to be good. Um, and I, I think that there's proactive stuff that we can do about helping to show more different perspectives, um, helping to make it so that it's a good environment for people to have discussions. Uh, but, you know, fundamentally, I think that that's, um, these are, I mean, this whole conference is about um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of the theme here, you know, the Westlessness theme is about the, the values um, that we bring um, and that these sets of countries bring and whether the world is going in that direction. And you know, I just think a lot of what social media and the internet are about are about giving individuals a voice, um, helping people express a plurality of opinions, being more open about that. It's not clear to me that um, that the world is guaranteed to go in that direction. We do see different regulatory models coming out of places like China that are spreading to other places as well. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think the regulation is so important because also regulatory models are spreading that I think encode more authoritarian values um, in more places around the world. I'm very worried about that. I, I think that we need to make sure that, uh, that the internet can continue to be a place where everyone can share their views openly and where the legal framework around this is one that encodes democratic values and open values. And I, I do think that it is, as part of that, we gotta move forward on regulation. Uh, hopefully we move forward quickly so before a more authoritarian model gets adopted in, in a lot of places first. Um, but a, a lot of that is going to be making sure that, that we all, including definitely us, live up to our responsibility to make sure that, uh, that when people can share and form communities, that that is a positive force for bringing people together um, and, and, and upholding these values. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. As you see, we could go on and on for another hour or two. The interest among these people um, in, in these issues is enormous and growing. And uh, I want to say that I'm glad that we started, not just this year, some years ago, to bring in your colleagues from Microsoft, uh, uh, Google and other high-tech digital uh, companies. And we need to continue to do, that, to do that. I think a sophisticated discussion about the current and future challenges to our societies uh, have to go far beyond classic military sec security. So thank you for coming. And if I can ask you one favor, come again next year. Uh, give him, let's give him a thank round you. of applause.